Welcome to a world where nothing is quite as it seems. Welcome to Fake Britain. It's just an ordinary house. It could be anywhere in the country, but this is the fake Britain house, and it's filled with fakes. You may not know it, but your home could be too. In this series, we'll be investigating the criminals trying to get their hands on your cash by using fraud, forgeries, and fakery. And I'll be showing you how you can avoid being taken for a ride. On today's show... Hunting down the serious criminals behind Britain's fakes. This doesn't look right, does it? Especially if you're in a lock-up like this. The fake high-end nail polish that's left some customers getting their fingers burnt. Looking at these photos now makes me feel physically sick. I feel ashamed that someone in this industry has caused this damage to a client. Fake computer hard drives that could cost you your data and your money. Two hefty nuts and bolts. I've been duped in a big way. And the flaming truth about fake hair dryers. If this was someone's house, then it could do considerable damage. All these clothes carry well-known designer labels, and they're all fake. It's the sort of stuff most of us know is sold on some market stalls right across the country. But to get these clothes into markets needs extensive organisation by the criminals, especially since the value of the goods often runs into millions. It's that organisation that's being targeted by trading standards and the police. And fake Britain went with them on a recent operation. 3am, Trading Standards HQ. Today we're going to do a enforcement exercise. Everything we've done in the last 12 months has led us to today. Mark Wilson is heading up an intelligence-led operation. They're targeting a group they believe are using a legitimate self-storage firm in order to stash fake goods destined for markets all over the southeast. If people start playing up, kicking off, I want them floored and I want them out of the way, cuffed and gone. 43 officers, including trading standards, scam busters and the police, from nine local authorities, are heading to the storage unit. The aim this morning is to intercept a number of groups of market traders who have identified an area where they can uh, make quite a bit of profit. The aim this morning is obviously working with the police here is to arrest them as they arrive. We're in. We're in. We're in. Now inside the storage unit, the team gets into position for the sting operation. The officers will sit tight for the market traders to arrive. Before long, the team hears voices and engines running outside the lockup. We don't want to drive off. There's no telling how the traders will react. They're now poised to strike. The short and sharp tactics used by the police have paid off as they apprehend six traders. Keys and mobile phones are seized and any vital information the phones may contain will be extracted and used as evidence. If the men have been found to have sold fake goods, it could land these traders up to two years in prison. With the suspects in handcuffs, it's time for Duncan Lamp and his team to start the hunt for fakes. We'll go, we'll go across all of the containers, looking over the top. If we find anything, we'll make a note of the number on the door and then we'll crop the bolt and have a look properly. Whatever the link to the men arrested, officers believe the storage units have been hired by an organised team using fake names and more than likely paying cash to leave no trace. But without knowing which ones they're using, they've got to search all 200 of them. And after an hour or so of searching, the team think they might have found some fakes. 
we're going to bowl crop this uh, container to see what's in. Lucky dip. <laughs> we have sacks. It's not long before they find what they're looking for. Hollister. Hollister, a popular clothing brand. Again, unfortunately, not my size. It's a big find. The fake sweaters in this small container alone could be worth around £10,000. As well as clothing, the team quickly uncovers an array of other fake gear. PC Matt Smith has found a stash of fake car key rings. Hands on, we've got Toyota, Porsche, see if we've got any other. Uh, there's Mazda in here. Numerous fake, cheaply made key rings with car logos on. Produced for pence over in the Far East and sold over here for a nice, tidy profit. From perfumes to electricals, the team are discovering more and more goods they believe are fake. Up boots. A faker's favourite for years, being sold on markets all over Britain. Three quarters of counterfeit items seized in Britain last year came from factories in China, where some were made by children paid as little as £10 a week and working up to 18 hours a day. Meanwhile, the search is continuing to turn up even more stuff. Here you've got two watches. This one is how the watches are coming into the country. Unbranded, no markings on the front. As we turn it over, no markings on the back. If stopped in customs, it's just a regular unbranded watch, which can legally be brought into the UK, no questions asked. We go to the white one, and once it's arrived, has been branded somewhere in the UK. You've got the ice markings on the face, and as we turn it around, again, you've got the markings on the back. That's how we go from one unbranded, cheap watch to one counterfeit ice watch. Heading to a local market disguised as the real McCoy, these watches can fetch up to £100 each. Counterfeiting continues to evolve and products can be imported either fully manufactured and produced or they can be imported in parts. Uh, what we've identified today is that there is um, a manufacturing element and uh, as well as the distribution element to the operation here. In total, officers seized just shy of 40,000 fake items with a street value of five million pounds. They were destined for markets all over the southeast. Where trading standards receive intelligence about counterfeiting as a priority, we will seek to deal with that uh, swiftly and we will target those individuals who are profiting from selling counterfeit goods. One, to protect the consumers and two, to protect legitimate local businesses. Uh, that's a hard-hitting message to those counterfeiters and persons seeking to sell counterfeit goods. Take a look at this. It's a portable hard drive used to store and transport computer files like documents, music and photos. It looks good, but it's what's inside that counts. In this case, very little. It's a fake. Sidmouth in Devon, home to amateur photographer David Trigger. He needed a new hard drive to back up his prized pictures, and looking online, he found what he thought was a bargain. A two terabyte, high speed storage device. I came across an advertisement saying, Hitachi Niso, half price. I thought that's not an absurd deal, but it's a good one. The drive was priced at $69.95. David did his research and found that before the half price discount, it was roughly the going rate for a premium hard drive of that size. So he snapped it up. When it arrived the following day, David was delighted with his purchase. Uh, very nice indeed, very nice. Weighty, beautifully organized. Uh, it's like a plastic strip all the way around and the USB port very neatly tucked in the corner and a status light for the drive. But when David plugged it into his computer and started trying to back up his photos, the hard drive kept coming up with an error message. I started to become very suspicious. I kept trying different operations. I even went back to reformatting the drive, as it says in the Quick Start Guide. 
wasn't really getting anywhere, but still didn't understand quite what was going on. David tried every trick in the book to get the drive to copy his files. Nothing seemed to work. He phoned Hitachi and spoke to the technical team. No one seemed to be able to get to the bottom of the problem. After wasting hours and hours trying to get the drive working, David decided to take some drastic action. I ended up in a position where I was getting very, very frustrated. I'm getting nowhere with the original supplier. Um, I have no refund. What do I have to lose? It's about time I actually knew the truth uh, and opened this thing up. But when David prized open the casing, nothing could prepare him for what he found. And behold, there are the contents of the Hitachi Niso drive. Two hefty nuts and bolts, hot melt glued into place to give it almost perfect balance. It feels just like the real thing when closed up. You would never know once that's closed. Crude but crafty fakery. The hard drive was instead just a small USB drive with less than 4% of the storage advertised. Nothing more than a cheap fake. It was the worst fears realised, really. Uh, I'd been duped uh, in a big way. It's humiliating and it makes you feel very much violated. And unfortunately, it's not just hard drives that are being targeted by the fakers. With 75% of households in Britain owning a computer, the data storage industry is big business. Electronic retailer Alan Dillon believes the fakers have now honed in on these things. USB flash drives. A USB flash drive is just a small portable uh, data storage device that can be plugged into any computer or device that has a USB port. Um, they come in a variety of sizes, all the way from small as 32 megabytes all the way up to one or two terabytes. The more storage space on a drive, the more costly it is to make. Alan believes fraudsters are making money by selling drives that advertise more storage space than they actually provide. We decided to investigate whether some USB sticks contain as much storage space as they say they do. So we took to the web to put this to the test. A couple of clicks later, we purchased a handful of sticks. We also heard there might be fake micro SD cards out there used in devices such as mobile phones, so we bagged one of them too. It was time to send them over to computer data recovery expert Mike Montgomery for a closer look. First up is the 32 gigabyte, which claims to be a Toshiba, although it wasn't sold to us by them. Once Mike's removed the chip, he can stick it into his special machine and... It's supposed to be a Toshiba 32 gig trans memory USB flash stick. It's actually eight gigabytes. It's a fake. Next up, a 64 gigabyte gold bar shaped USB stick. Let's see what we've got. It is a fake gold bar, but is it a fake USB? I don't even need to take the chip off this one because it's actually marked on there eight gigabytes. So supposedly 64 gig, it's a fake. And after putting two more USB sticks through their paces, the last one Mike attempts to test is the 32 gigabyte micro SD card. This one uh, won't even be recognized by the computer. Well, I suspected this one was a fake, but it doesn't even work. It's uh, just hanging the computer, trying to read the device. That in itself is actually worse than a fake because it just doesn't work. So out of the five Mike tested, three USB sticks were fake and the micro SD card appeared to be faulty. It means you could very well be buying drives with less storage than you're paying for. But there's worse to come. Not only are the fraudsters making themselves a tidy profit at your expense, most people won't even know they've been ripped off. So what we've got here is a genuine 16 gig USB flash drive and a fake 16 gig USB flash drive. They don't look any different from each other, just one's coloured green, one colours red. So when we plug the genuine USB flash drive into the computer, it will read as 16 gigabyte. So the computers reported the size of the genuine USB drive correctly. Now the fake 16 gigabyte USB stick does in fact only contain a one gigabyte chip. Will the computer pick up on this? And when we plug the fake USB flash drive, it also comes up and tells us 16 gigabytes, 
but we actually know it's only one gigabyte. So a fake USB flash drive is fooled the computer into thinking that it's 16 gigabyte. So what chances a consumer got of realizing that they've been duped into buying fake USB? The fakers are doing two things. Making the USB stick fool your computer into thinking it's bigger than it is, and making you think the stick is storing your files when it's actually recording over them again and again. If you put something on there, you want to be able to retrieve the data and know the data is actually going to be on there. So when you go back to get your distation essay music files, you want to know that they haven't been corrupted or lost. And just like probably the supplier who sold them to you is going to be gone, they might be gone as well. But you're only going to realize you've bought a fake when it's too late and you've lost your data. But the authorities are determined to unplug the fakes. In West London, trading standards have just busted a bunch of rogue retailers for selling a variety of fake electrical goods in high street shops up and down the southeast. Mohammed Tariq was at the helm. Amongst the haul, totaling around a million pounds worth of stock, there was a stash of fake USB sticks. If they're fake, you don't know what memory's on there. They might not have the memory that it's actually advertising on there or displaying on the, on the packaging. Luckily, the journey of these fakes to our homes has now been short-circuited. But be careful, there's plenty more out there. For people buying memory cards to store data, beware of fakes because you may as well not back up at all. You'll lose your data and your money. This is an American brand of nail polish, CND Shellac. Not quite my shade. But for thousands of women, it's what they choose to have put on their nails in UK salons. It's a successful brand and it's not cheap. They seem to be the reason some salons have decided they'll make more money if the shellac service they're selling is a fake. CND Shellac is a nail polish treatment and was created in the USA by a company called Creative Nail Design, or CND for short. Nail technician Natasha Lee says it's a product that's been a massive hit with her customers. It was designed and created for women that were paying for manicures and they weren't getting their money's worth because they just weren't lasting. Now the company says CND Shellac was some five years in development and went through around 7,000 lab tests before it went to market. Its ingredients are a closely guarded trade secret but they claim 14 days without chipping. The genuine treatment costs around £25 per application, depending on where you go, so it's roughly twice the price of other nail services. Now, here's the thing. To use this product, you need to be a qualified NVQ beautician and approved to use it by the manufacturer before you can actually buy the stuff. But there are believed to be dozens of unscrupulous operators out there who are faking it advertising they're offering the genuine CND shellac service, but in fact giving you a cheaper Chinese gel polish instead, without the requisite training, equipment or application procedures. And because of these fakes, customers are ending up out of pocket and more worryingly with damaged nails. According to Gina Ackers of the Hair and Beauty Industry Authority, it's a growing problem. There are many, many concerns when you have nail technicians and salons actually offering services that they are not trained to do. It's really, really important from a client's point of view that they're getting safe and good quality nails treatments. There are around 18,000 nail technicians in Britain that are approved by the manufacturer to carry out the service, and this is how it works. Once the nails are cleaned and prepped, the technician adds a base coat and a colour coat, and then finally a top coat curing the nails in the UV lamp for precise timings in between. And voila, a shellac service. Ooh, nice nails. It's a whole different story when it comes to removal, and that's when you really see the difference between the professional product and the fakes. A lesson which university student Sophie Edwards has learnt. I sourced a salon that was local to me that I'd heard from word of mouth of a few people that said they were doing the shellac and I, I went and tried it. Actually did have a CND poster at the bottom um, of their window. The process seemed to be what I thought was the CND shellac process. But after an hour in the salon having her nails shellac, 
Sophie was left feeling a little disappointed. I'd seen pictures and heard from people that the finish is absolutely amazing and it didn't seem that way and it felt really bulky on my nails. There was just a feel to it that didn't seem right. When Sophie had the product removed, it turns out her instincts were spot on. I didn't have a CND shellac product and I'd had, in fact, a fake shellac product. I felt let down by the salon that I'd been to. I felt like I was a bit of a mug, actually, especially the price that I paid for the product and for the procedure. But Sophie, there's a lot of it about. The beauty industry is hearing of more and more women who thought they were getting the genuine product, but instead got their fingers burnt, quite literally. Catherine Hutt thought she was getting the genuine product when she booked into a local salon. My first appointment was on the Friday night and they applied the base coat to my nails and then told me that it wasn't sticking to my nails. So then they decided to try and buff the top of my nails to see if they could get it to stick. And at one point that actually was a little bit painful, um, which I think is one of the things that made me think, oh, this doesn't seem quite right. Within a few days, the nails started to chip. One of the main reasons that I went to have um, a shellac manicure but the thought of it not chipping and lasting for at least two weeks. Um, so I was really, really disappointed, actually, in that. A few weeks later, it was time to get the polish removed and then reapplied. She decided to go to a different salon, where she was met by nail technician Jenny Smith. Hi, honey. How are you doing? Good, thank you. But she was about to discover she'd fallen for a fake. So when Catherine came into the salon, she said that she'd gone to another salon and asked for shellac, and that's what she thought she had on her nails. It wasn't shellac that she had on her nails in any way, shape or form. It was something completely different. Yes, Catherine had had a brush with the fake shellac. Jenny tried to soak off the product. We wrapped it up for the normal 10 minutes and it didn't budge, it hadn't budged at all. It just wasn't coming off. When she did eventually get the fake shellac off, Jenny took these photographs of the damage to Catherine's nails. On this one, you can clearly see the big white patch here. And then the thumb damage, you can clearly see that these white patches are quite severe. Looking at these photos now makes me feel physically sick. I feel ashamed that someone in this industry has caused this damage to a client's natural nails. It took around six months for Catherine's nails to return to normal, an experience that's expensive and distressing. It made me feel quite angry, and had I thought that there was even the smallest chance that it would damage my nails, I wouldn't have done it. Unfortunately, we're seeing this more and more frequently. There's a lot of people jumping onto the beauty industry bandwagon lately, thinking that they can come in and make a quick buck. They're not doing things the correct way. Natasha says the fakers are damaging the whole industry. Good morning. Yes, no problem. What are you looking for? The people that want and choose to use the fake shellacs tend to be people who are wanting to cut corners and cut savings. With that, it tends to be the people that don't want to pay for the appropriate training. They are a blight to the industry because they do taint the name for technicians that are spending their time, their energy and their money making sure that they're doing a good service. But it's not just the professional beauty market that's fallen prey to the fakers. Trading Standards Officer Simon Cripwell has recently seized a stack of what appear to be fake hair dryers, destined for bedroom beauticians everywhere. This is what we suspect to be a counterfeit GHD product. GHD Precious, it's got written on the top, a limited edition gift set. We've got two products here. One is a GHD branded um, travel hair dryer, and the other is a GHD branded hair straightener. We've seen fake GHD straighteners doing the rounds on fake Britain before, but the fake hair dryer's a new kid on the block. The beauty market is absolutely huge and we are seeing an increasing number of electrical products and other products related to the beauty market coming onto market stalls which are selling counterfeit goods. As well as the manufacturer's logo on the box, this hairdryer comes complete with a vast array of extras. It's attention to detail amongst the most advanced Simon has ever seen. These particular products also come with very convincing paperwork. Um, you can actually register your counterfeit GHD straighteners uh, with the genuine company. They also come with um, the same safety instructions that you would expect to find on genuine items. 
But has the same attention to detail gone into the safety side of things? The brand has confirmed it's a fake, but is it dangerous? Simon Critwell's got concerns. So, we take the fake hairdryer to a testing lab, where testing safety engineer Lee Picton does what he does best, test. My initial impressions are, yeah, you know, it does look the real deal, basically. The hairdryer itself, um, it feels like a genuine travel hairdryer, um, good weight, so it feels expensive. Yes, but looks can be deceiving. So Lee starts with the plug. So as you can see here, uh, the conductor is soldered. Um, this can cause the terminal in the plug to heat up. And that heat could lead to fire or to the plug melting, which is why soldered wires wouldn't meet British safety standards. I would deem this to be potentially unsafe in a household environment. If you were drying your hair and the plug melted, it could be dangerous. But there's worse to come as Lee prepares to carry out an important European standard test that all appliances of this type must go through. Right, so what I'm about to do is place the polythene over the air inlet and turn the power on um, and set the hairdryer to level three, so which is, will, will be its highest power input. This test is to simulate what would happen if the back of the hairdryer was covered up by someone's hair or a towel, for example. This will be restricting the airflow uh, into the inlet of the hairdryer. To meet safety standards, hair dryers on the UK market must have a vital safety feature called a thermal cutout. This will shut down the hair dryer if it overheats to stop it from burning the user, or in the worst case scenario, catching fire. If it's a genuine product, what should happen anytime soon is the thermal cutout should operate, cutting the supply to the hair dryer. But two minutes in, it's still going strong. The thermal cutout should have cut out by now. Um, as you can see, the plastic is melting, so it's definitely a fake product. With the thermal cutout not operating, uh, the hair dryer has caught fire. It's given a significant amount of flames, um, and if this was someone's house, then it could do considerable damage. Without this vital safety feature in place, the fake hair dryer has the potential to cause a fire and also burn anyone unfortunate enough to use it. This type of test, um, it is a bit of a shock. Normally you wouldn't expect such a fault to occur. A genuine product, thermal cutter would operate and the test would have ended without any hazardous situations occurring. Someone could easily end up buying one of these dangerous hair dryers and think they're not only the real thing, but perfectly safe. Lee fears it's only a matter of time before they cause serious damage. For people who potentially purchase such products, uh, it's definitely, definitely worrying. That's all from Fake Britain. Goodbye. Ian needs to silence Patrick, but how far will he go? EastEnders is next on BBC One. I love you, three little words Miranda's having real problems with at 8.30. And then they're back. The UCOS team return for a brand new series of new tricks, helping an old lag get to the truth about his grandson at nine.